There's so many ways to start today. I don't even know where to begin. I'm just so, I'm, I'm excited. Excited for our graduates, excited for the families. I'm excited that Mike's here. Many of my family are here. It's just, a, it's a really, really special time. And, uh, and happy birthday. Uh, you're like, well, it's not, it's not my birthday. Well, somebody is probably your happy birthday to you. But uh, today is Pentecost. So this is the birthday of the church. So happy birthday. Isn't that exciting? If we, uh, I, I'm not great at landing dates, but if we date from 33, this is the 1,000th. 991st birthday of the church. That means we're nine years away from our 2000th birthday of not only the church, but also of the Great Commission. So let's think about that from your friendly neighborhood missions pastor over the next nine years. How do we get ready for the 2000th, uh, there you go, anniversary of the Great Commission? So happy birthday. But we're it's so excited. As, uh, as graduates, as you were coming up on the stage, Pastor Mike was like, man, I like how many of these folks have been to Idaho. And that's pretty cool. Uh, many of you have carried a legacy with you of serving here in Marietta, across the states in Idaho. Some of you have been to a goat roping, which most of America has not experienced that. And you have. So that's pretty exciting. But we are so excited to walk alongside with you you, not only these last few years, but whatever's next for you. Uh, even if you're away at school, we're going to kind of hold the rope here with you, and we'll be praying for you. Today, uh, we want to cover a pretty wide section of Samson's life. We're going to be in the book of Judges. So if you've got your Bible, open up to Judges chapter 14, and we're going to actually look at chapter 14 and 15. I'm not going to read every word of those to you, but I am going to try and give you a sense of the overall story. Now, this series on Samson falls within our series that we have called Justice League. It's, it's a series through the book of Judges, and it's sobering to look at the book of Judges and look at what happens when people get farther and farther and farther away from God. And these are the people that are supposed to be the people of God. And yet there is this cycle in Judges of rebellion, of God saving them, and then things get worse. And they just get farther and farther away. We've, we're taking a few weeks now to look at this particular judge, the judge Samson. And as a kid, I always thought of, of Samson as kind of appropriate in our Justice League series. I always thought of Samson as kind of like a superhero. I was drawn to comics and superheroes anyway. And so I always thought of Samson a little bit like the Incredible Hulk, you know, somebody with incredible strength. And that's the way that the Bible describes him. If nothing else, this is the strongest person to ever live. Some of the things that he does with his physical strength seem absolutely impossible. And yet, because the Lord blessed him, he was able to do them. But he was a man that his character did not keep up with his opportunity. His character did not match his physical strength. The Lord gave him a blessing of physical strength that took away a lot of other limitations. And when those limits were lifted off of him, his character did not keep up. His relationship with God did not keep up keep up. His desire, the purpose that he was meant for did not keep up. And that's what we're going to see a couple of times in these two chapters. We're going to see kind of a cycle in the life of Samson. We're going to see that a divine plan of God in his life could not be thwarted, even in his disobedience, but that he missed opportunities. We're going to see a cycle of sin and then consequences. Samson will fall into sin, sin that could have been prevented. And then that sin, as it always does, has destructive consequences. Because of those consequences, Samson will go into rage. He will get angry and that will lead him into violence. He will use the gifts that God has given him, not for the glory of God, but for the glory of himself or just to be servants of his rage and violence. But here is the beautiful thing that we're going to see in the life of Samson is that even in these cycles of sin and violence, the Lord is still working. The Lord doesn't waste it. Does Samson miss some opportunities? Absolutely. But this overarching plan of God to redeem people and call his people back to himself continues. The Lord doesn't let, let the most tragic circumstances in our lives be wasted. He uses those for his glory. 
So let's begin by looking at chapter 14 in the book of Judges. And let's read just the first seven verses. It will not be on the screen. We're going to bounce around so much. Uh, in a moment, there are some verses that I pinpointed and put on the screen. But just read along with me. And if you don't have a Bible with you today, it's no problem. Just listen. And I think you'll enjoy the story. So Samson went down to Timnah and saw a young Philistine woman. When he returned, he said to his father and mother, I have seen a Philistine wo woman in Timnah. Now go get her for me as my wife. His father and mother replied, isn't there an acceptable woman among your relatives or among our people? Must you go to the uncircumcised Philistines to get a wife? But Samson said to his father, get her for me. She's the right one for me. His parents did not know that this was from the Lord who was seeking an occasion to confront the Philistines. For, all, for at that time, they were ruling over Israel. Samson went down to Timnah together with his father and mother. As they approached the vineyards of Timnah, suddenly a young lion came roaring toward him. The spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon him so that he tore the lion apart with his bare hands as he might have torn a young goat. But... He told neither his father nor his mother what he had done. Then he went down and talked with the woman, and he liked her. So the beginning of this story, where we kind of launch here, Samson is, again, a man of incredible strength, but also, more importantly, a man who has been, from his birth, like we saw last week, dedicated to the Lord. His parents, good parents, godly parents, dedicated him to the Lord. They even took a Nazarite vow upon his entire life. A Nazarite vow described in Numbers chapter 6 was something that, that many times the people of God would enter into, but only for a time. They would, they would avoid anything, alcohol or grape juice or grapes or anything that came from the vine. They would let their hair grow long as kind of a symbol of that Nazarite vow, and they would stay away from anything dead. And during that time, it was kind of like how we consider fasting. During that time, there was a special dedication to the Lord, a special communion with God. Now, at the end of that vow, the person that had taken the Nazarite vow would cut their hair. And that was the symbol to all those around them that the vow had been complete. So next week, when we see some really interesting things surrounding Samson's hair, it, it makes sense because that is the completion. That's the final moment of that vow. But Samson was supposed to have that special communion, that special relationship, that special connection with God his entire life. That was the dedication that the Lord called his parents to. And this is one of the very few people in the Bible that God shows up to announce their birth. It is clear that Samson has a purpose, a unique and special purpose on his life because God shows up to announce his birth. I mean, he's on a short list and Jesus is on that list too. So it's pretty, it's like, you know, if, if you're a basketball player that ends up on some sort of list with Michael Jordan and LeBron, you're feeling pretty good about yourself. Like Samson is on this very short list of a birth announced by God, a special purpose on his life. And yet Samson, as we can see here, is just kind of living for himself. He is, is called to be a leader of Israel and yet he sees a Philistine woman. And in the, at uh, this passage, he says, dad, I want you to go get her for me. Do you see how many times, just in those seven verses that we just read, that Samson just mentions himself? Go get her for me. She is the right one for me. It literally means that his eyes were set on her. He was thinking about himself. He was thinking about her. He wasn't necessarily thinking about the Lord. By the lion, uh, he... He uses his great strength to tear this lion apart with his bare hands, the Bible says. I just, I just love that it mentioned it's with his bare hands, he defeats this lion. I started looking up statues, uh, art depictions of this fight between Samson and the lion, and they always seem to have a, a big Samson and a little lion, and I think that's to kind of illustrate his strength, you know, the biblical description of his strength. But when I think of Samson fighting a lion, and I've, I've only been around lions a little bit, but they're always big. That's a huge animal. And he just absolutely takes on this animal. But 
again, what you see in Samson's life is this slow burn, this constant, slow, subtle, but steady moving away from his purpose, this subtle but steady moving away from his vow, this subtle but steady moving away from his relationship with God. It's easy in, this, in these seven verses to be thinking, man, it's so amazing. Samson wrestled and defeated a lion. And sometimes it's easy to miss. Samson broke part of his vow right here because he touched something dead. Think about the gift that he was given, incredible strength. And think about the purpose and the vow that he was born into. Part of that was not to touch anything dead. The Lord wanted to use, intended to use Samson's strength for more than just physical battle. Though his strength, his gifts could be used for physical battle, I mean, this is a great warrior. The Lord had a bigger purpose in mind. Now, for a few verses, let me just tell you what happens. As the, uh, the wedding ceremony begins, Samson and his parents are traveling back to see this Philistine woman again. And along the way, Samson sees that carcass of the lion. So once again, he touches a dead animal, this time to scoop honey. A honeycomb had developed inside the carcass of the lion. He eats this honey. He shares it with his family. But the Bible's real specific to tell us he never told his parents that he killed the lion. He never told his parents where the honey came from. He was keeping on the appearance of sanctification. He was keeping the appearance of his vow, and yet he was breaking his vow behind closed doors, so to speak. So he goes down, and uh, as the party, the feast, the, festi- uh, the, f- the ceremony begins, he's actually given 30 uh, companions, Philistine companions, and as the ceremony gets going, he gives them a riddle. It has to do with the honey and the carcass, and he says, during the seven days of this ceremony, if you can figure out this riddle, and he talks about you know something strong and something to eat, and, uh, and then he, he says, if you can figure out this riddle, then I will give you a gift. I'll give you these sets of incredible clothes. And so for seven days, these guys, these companions, these Philistine men cannot figure out the riddle. In fact, they get so frustrated that they threaten Samson's wife and her father. They say, if you don't find out what's going on, we're going to burn you to death. This is, this is the R-rated part of the Bible right here, right? This series could be the R-rated Bible because that's where, I mean, there is, there's violence in this. There's, there's just wild stuff, but that's literally what they say. We're going to burn you to death. When she, she nags at him long enough, he tells her, this is Samson's weakness, isn't it? He tells her what the riddle means. They're able to, to come back to Samson within the time frame in the evening of the seventh, the final day that they had, and they tell him what the riddle meant. And then we see the cycle. He turns into rage. He turns into violence. He's focused on himself not on the purposes of the Lord. And what Samson does is he goes down to Ashkelon and kills 30 other men and takes their clothes and gives them as the payoff of this debt. The R-rated Bible. It's not prescribed to us in the Bible, and we need to understand that about the Bible. Not everything in the Bible is a command for us to follow, for us to go and do. This is part of how we know the Bible is so real. It shows us the good and the bad and the ugly, and it says this is how far uh, Samson's character had slipped. He would rather than, than default on this bet, he would rather turn to violence. Now, the beautiful thing is that the Lord is still using this. The Lord is seeing his people and they are oppressed by the Philistine people and he wants Samson to lead in some victories against the Philistines. And though this may not be exactly how the Lord would have done it, the Lord doesn't waste it. He allows for this. And we're gonna look back at that in just a moment. So in... uh, In verse 19 of chapter 14, verse 19 of chapter 14, then the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon him 
He went down to Ashkelon, struck down 30 of their men, stripped them of everything and gave their clothes to those who had explained the riddle. Burning with anger, he returned to his father's home. And Samson's wife was given to one of his companions who had attended him at the feast. Verse 19 is a strange phrase. The spirit of the Lord came powerfully on him. The spirit of the Lord came powerfully on him. It's not a phrase we expect to be there because we see this rebellion. We see this man moving away from God. And yet multiple times in these two chapters, we see this phrase, the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon him. He's still in his cycle of, of destruction. He's still in his cycle of sin. And yet the Lord doesn't waste it. Let me give you a quick overview of 15, then we're going to come back and look at some principles for a second. At the beginning of 15, later on in the time of wheat harvest, Samson took a young goat and went to visit his wife. He said, I'm going to my wife's room, but her father would not let him go in. I was sure you hated her, he said. So I gave her to your companion. Samson is furious at this point. He even says, now my anger and my retribution, my, my, my violence against the Philistines is going to be okay because look at how they've wronged me. So Samson does what, again, seems impossible. He catches 30 foxes. There's a lot in commentaries about how did he catch, I'm mean, not 30, 300 foxes. I, I don't, he caught 300 foxes. He's, he's good at it. And so he, he caught 300 foxes. He ties their tails together and he lights a, a, a torch in between them. And then they run through and they destroy the food source of the Philistines. It's an incredible strategy. An incredible strategic military mind. He didn't even have to gather an army of his countrymen to win this battle. He literally just takes whatever gifts and abilities God has given him and he wins this battle. But again, this is coming out of his, out of his sin and out of his violence. Let's go down to... Um, Verse 11, the Philistines, because they're not happy about what has happened, they are threatening the other people of God, the people of Judah. So in verse 11, in chapter 15, it says, then 3,000 men from Judah went down to the cave in the rock of Atom, and they said to Samson, don't you realize that the Philistines are rulers over us? What have you done to us? The men of Judah are not realizing that the Lord is, is fighting battles for them. He's saying, Samson, what have you done to us? And I, I get where they're coming from. I'd feel that way too. He answered, I merely did to them what they did to me. Do you see it again? The phrase that Samson uses over and over, what, what's happening to me, what I want. She looks good in my eyes. Then they said to him, we're going to tie you hand you over to the Philistines, Samson said, swear to me that you won't kill me yourselves. Verse 13, agreed, they answered. We'll only tie you up and hand you over to them. We'll not kill you. So they bound him with two new ropes, led him up from the rock. As he approached Lehi, the Philistines came toward him shouting. Here's that phrase again. The spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon him. The ropes of his arms became like charred flax. The bindings dropped from his hands. Finding a fresh jawbone of a donkey, he grabbed it and struck down a thousand men. Drop down to verse 20 for just a second. After this great battle, this is the phrase, Samson led Israel for 20 years in the days of the Philistines. I... Uh, when I was reading over this, I thought to myself, if I was in salmon, I would know where to go to get a jawbone. And then I was like, I bet Amazon has one. So all week, everyone on the church staff has been looking forward to the arrival of the jawbone. Because in my mind, as a kid, you know, you're thinking a jawbone. How does he do that, right? But now when you see one in person, you're like, okay, I see how that could be a weapon. I, you know, I don't know if it's, but it was a good weapon. It's intense. <sighs> I wouldn't want to go up against Samson wielding one of these. But it makes a lot more sense, doesn't it? Still, 
He fights off a thousand, kills a thousand men. The R-rated part of the Bible here. The violence. How far his character had slipped. And yet the Lord kept using him. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him. The Lord didn't waste even what Samson was doing when he was completely focused on himself. Very quickly, I want to look at a couple of things. Look at the slow burn in Samson's life. Number one, Samson was given an incredible and unique opportunity in uh, 14.4, not only having to do with his birth, but in 14.4, it reminds us that the Lord wanted to use Samson in a special way to lead his people out of oppression from the Philistines. It said that, that even his parents did not fully understand this purpose. Samson was given a special and unique opportunity. But his selfish decisions were his destruction. His selfish decisions were his destruction. Remember how many times he says me and I. We'll just look at a few of those. In 14.3, um, his father and mother said, isn't it, there an acceptable woman among your relatives or among your people? But Samson said to his father, get her for me. She's the right one for me. He's thinking about himself. In 14.7, he liked her. And over and over again in 14 and 15, we see that reference back to himself. Number three, the Lord used Samson to fulfill a bigger plan. What the Lord was doing, what the Lord was active in, Samson was a tool in the Lord's hand. Even though he was a disobedient tool, and, I, and I'm not just trying to, you know, uh, that just sounded like I was, you know... <laughs> making a statement about Samson there. He was a disobedient tool in the hands of God. He was, he was still used by God because multiple times in 14.6, 14.19, and 15.14, it says that the, the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon Samson. And then in 15.20, he leads Israel for 20 years. So the Lord was still using Samson even though he was rebelling against God but Samson never took the Lord's life instructions seriously. From his birth, he had three parts of that Nazarite vow to keep, to stay away from alcohol and anything that comes from a grape, to not touch anything that was dead, and to not cut his hair. And those were not just obedience, they were outward symbols of an inward commitment, very similar to what we understand baptism to be. Now, in addition to that, there's plenty of other commands of the Lord not to intermarry with the Philistines, not to murder, not to have this kind of violence, not to be selfish, not to be greedy. Those are all understood. It's not like it was just those three commands. It was those three special commitments to institute that special connection with God. And in addition to that, all the other commands of God. But Samson never took the Lord Lord's instructions for life seriously. He thought, this is speculation, but it seems to be the way he lived. He thought, I am strong enough on my own that I don't have to live the Lord's way. I'll live my way. Now, I don't have Samson's strength. That is clearly obvious. But man, I can live like that. I want to live my way. I'm going to do it my, my way. Look at this list, and I'm, and I'm going to kind of burn through these. Just from what we see in these two chapters, here's what could have been. Samson had the opportunity to come from a legacy family. He could have been a powerful warrior and leader of men. He had a great strategic Mind. He was called to be a national leader. He could have been a strong husband to his wife. He could have been a spiritual powerhouse. Once, uh, over and over, it says the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon him. The spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon him. 
He could have been a military strategist. He was a fierce combatant. He could have been a man of faith. And I want to come back to that one in a moment. And certainly he could have been a hero of legend, a legendary hero. But instead, what do we actually see in the life of Samson? He was a rebellious son, a selfish, strong man, a wasted mind, a judge moving in the wrong direction. He's ruled by lust. He's used by the Lord, but he has no real relationship with the Lord. He's an easily offended bully. He's an ill-tempered brawler. He's ruled by his appetites. And instead of being a legendary hero, he's a tragic tale. That's the reality. 20 years, Samson ruled, judged Israel. And instead of great victories against the Philistines, what we know most about Samson is the, the faults of his character. So what do we do with that today? First thing I want to look at is, is missing from Samson's story is any sense that he understands the power, the bigness of God. There's no prayer in his story. There's no humility in his story. There's no sense of purpose or mission in his story. But what about us? We saw the slow burn in Samson's life, but look at the opportunity that we have in ours. We, like Samson, you graduates today, as you go to this next step in your life, you have a unique and incredible opportunity. You have the chance for humility and prayer and connection to God and life that has purpose and meaning wrapped around what God wants for you. You have a unique opportunity. With no limitations. Samson's behavior ran wild. Maybe we should look at our limitations and weaknesses as a gift from God sometimes. But even beyond that, in a culture today where it says, do what you think is best. Follow your heart. You do you, right, Cindy? You do you. <laughs> we need to remember this second reality. Our heart is not our best guide. My heart is so selfish. My heart's focused on me, just like Samson. My heart's focused on what I want. And our heart is not our best guide. It is intended to lead us to the Lord who is our best guide. If we recognize the weakness of our own heart, we can recognize the goodness of God. Number three, and this is for each and every one of us, but graduates, I want you to listen real closely. Students, I want you to listen real closely to this. The Lord wants to use you. The Lord wants to use you in your family, in your school, on your hall, with your friends. The Lord wants to use you. And if you disobey, his plan continues. But think of all the opportunities that Samson missed. The Lord wants to use you. And finally, and again, this is especially for our students. Take seriously the Lord's instructions about life. Take seriously the Lord's instructions about life. Remember that lust is a dead idol. It's a dead idol. It loves you so much less than Jesus does. The Lord's instructions about life are meant to be those guardrails that keep us moving in his direction. They're not intended to be things that keep us away from fun and enjoyment. They are the, the direction to have the most fulfilled and purposeful life imaginable. Take seriously the Lord's instructions about life. In this passage, we've seen Samson's slow burn farther and farther away from God. But this is our opportunity to, to check our own lives. To come back and say, well, where am I? Am I slowly burning in the opposite direction of God? Or am I, is my fire growing within me to know him more? Would you bow your heads and close your eyes with me? I have two opportunities in the invitation today. The first is for those of you that need to know Jesus. And say, I, I'm more like Samson than I want to admit. What's the cure for that? It's not to try harder. 
It's not to try and build a character out of your own strength. That's actually the mistake of Samson. The solution, the cure, is to give your heart and your life to Jesus. And that begins at a moment just like this of surrender. Not a moment of of any kind of weird ceremony, just a moment of surrender. A moment where it's just you and the Lord and you say, Lord Jesus, I need you. No matter how strong, no matter how successful I look to people on the outside, I need you. I need your forgiveness. I need a relationship with you. I need your love. I need to know you. I need your presence in my life. Nothing else makes sense. I need you. Lord, forgive me. Come into my life. Save me. Give me a home with you for all of eternity. And the amazing thing is, friend, the Lord responds to that. If that's your heart today, I encourage you to pray a prayer similar to that in your own words. And then our pastors are gonna be around. We'll be at the doors as you leave, but there's also resources on the table in the back that will help you begin this relationship with God. But my encouragement is don't do it alone. Let this church family come alongside you and celebrate with you. The second invitation is for any of us relying on our own strength. I guarantee you this, none of us have the strength of Samson. I definitely have the weaknesses of Samson. And praise God that he can use me even in my weakness. He can use you even in our weakness. But he wants to use us with purpose, with mission, with opportunity. You have a unique opportunity. You are called to a unique position And the Lord wants to use you. If you would be so bold today, pray this simple prayer. Lord, this week, starting today, would you use me? However you want to, would you use me? I don't know what your week holds, but I know the Lord will respond to that prayer. Lord Jesus, we submit ourselves to you and we love you. Thank you for this birthday celebration of the church. Thank you for the example of Samson. Even though he's a tragic tale, we see ourselves in him. And Lord, it points us more and more to you. Lord Jesus, hear our cry, our desperation for you. In the powerful name of Jesus, I pray.